Thanks very much for the invitation, and it's a great honor to be here uh, speaking in honor of Donald Nevin. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about Northern Ireland, though I'm sure that we will talk about Northern Ireland uh, during the Q&A, and, and Katie will obviously be talking about it a lot. And the reason is just that I know well that nearly everybody in this hall knows a lot more about Northern Ireland than I do, since I'm just a guy from the South, you know. So I'm going to play to my strengths. That also means I'm not going to talk in the lecture about what's going to happen, because I don't know what's going to happen. Again, I'm sure that we'll discuss that in the q and I'm going to talk about what has happened in the past and how we got we, where we are today. So I am actually going to give you a little bit of, uh, of history during this talk, but my, 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 my firm belief is that you understand where we're at, not just why Brexit happened, but why the negotiations have gone in the way that they did, if you know a little bit of, of, of history. So, yeah, this is the book that was referred to earlier, and I suppose the first thing to say about it is it's a book that was written by an Irishman about Brexit for a French audience, you know, which has its pluses and minuses. I suppose one thing it meant is I wasn't trying to second guess how the English reader was going to react to everything I said. I just tried to explain to the French who don't really know what's going on exactly what happened as far as I can see it. And obviously, as an Irishman, I'm very concerned and I'm up front and say, look, I have my biases because I'm Irish, but at least I'm neither a Remainer nor a Lever. And so at least I'm, I don't have those biases which are polluting the discourse on the other side of uh, the Irish Sea. So that was published on, on the 31st of October, just in time for Halloween. And um, it's coming out now on the 31st of January in English. Now, the completest among you are the people who just like to spend money. You know, don't, don't feel that you, you shouldn't buy both. Uh, the, the second version has been uh, updated and so on, and various holes have been filled in. And there were also various tweaks so as not to unnecessarily offend British sensibilities. I mean, if you have to offend them, you know, offend them, but not unnecessarily, you know. So uh, I, I know that the Northern Irish are very good at parsing words carefully to detect their hidden political meanings. And so, so the completists among you uh, can do that if you uh, wish. Um, I'm going to start with this fellow. And I know that Blair Horan knows who this fellow is because he's already uh, mentioned him. So who is this fellow, uh, people? So we remember him because of the policemen that were named after him in Ireland, uh, the Peelers. So this is Robert Peel. Uh, on the 2nd of July of this year, Mrs. May was frantically preparing the checkers meeting, and one of her ever loyal backbenchers, Jacob Rees-Mogg, wrote in the Telegraph that if she didn't watch out, she would suffer the same fate as this fellow back in 1846. Now, there were immediately various journalists and scholars and commentators who explained exactly why the historical analogy was wrong, but the Tories have a history of reaching for precisely this analogy. Uh, in the spring of 1961, Harold Macmillan had performed his famous U-turn, had decided that the UK should, after all, join the EEC, and there were various conservative backbenchers who were getting a little bit twitchy because of what this might mean for the relationship with the Commonwealth, and in his diary on the 19th of November, he notes that it's all getting terribly like 1846. So the Tories have a history. And it didn't end in 1846, by the way. Now, it, it, it's, it's, it's reasonable, I suppose, that Robert Peel should have split his party in 1846, given what he did. So the Conservatives were always the party of the aristoc aristocratic landlords. They had a vested interest in high food prices, therefore, that would keep land rents up. Uh, the Liberals wanted free trade. The Tories wanted agricultural protection. It's Robert Peel who repeals the Corn Laws, who moves towards free trade. That's quite paradoxical, and it's not surprising that the Tory party split uh, over it. Now, eventually, a belief in free trade becomes part of sort of religious political orthodoxy in London, but there are always some conservatives who remain uh, skeptical, and we get these periodic eruptions, such as, for example, in 1881, when there is something called the Fair Trade League, uh, formed. So fair trade always means, you know, we want a little bit more protection. So it's basically a Donald Trump type of thing. You know, we are being too open, the other crowd aren't being fair, so we should even things up. And if they won't admit our stuff duty free, then we, you know, then we should put tariffs on our imports of, of their stuff. Now, one of the things that kind of rings a bell here at, uh, in context of where we are today is that uh, they didn't think this league that the UK should uh, sign up to trade deals unless they would be terminable at a year's notice. 
you know, so they wanted the right always to be able to get out of any deal without uh, entanglements, as they referred to them, so that it would always conserve liberty uh, of action. And there was an imperial aspect to it in that they wanted to have tariffs on foreign food, i.e. non-empire food, uh, but not tariffs on, on, on empire food. So there was already this idea of, of discriminating in favour of uh, the empire. So there was an election fought over this in 1885. The Conservative Party was completely split. And this is just a citation from a, a historian of the event. So some decided that they better just say, yes, in fact, we are free traders. Uh, others said, no, no, actually, we are fair traders. And still others attempted to sit on the fence. So they were all over the place uh, in 1885. And so, as we know, the Liberals split. Joe takes the Unionists out of the Liberal Party to form the Liberal Unionists, and they eventually go into coalition with the Conservatives. And in 1912, I think, they merge with the Conservatives, thus forming the Conservative and Unionist Party of our own day. But not being content with splitting one party, uh, Big Joe went on and did his best to try to split the second. So at this stage, he's in government. Uh, well, then he quits the government, I suppose, because he wants to embark on this campaign. He was the colonial secretary, and he was really keen on, on the colonies. And uh, he advocated uh, imperial preference, so they would have free trade, uh, import uh, uh, goods from the empire duty-free, uh, but have tariffs vis-a-vis -vis everybody else. So they wanted preferential trade deals, preferential in favour of the empire. The problem with that was you can't really have a discriminatory trade policy treating your empire better than everybody else if you're not imposing tariffs on anybody. So as George Dangerfield said, his proposal had to be to erect a tariff wall around the UK with the specific purpose of then bashing holes in it through which only imperial goods uh, would pass. And, I mean, this is a nice little quote from him because it shows that he's, in a sense, a kind of a Jean Monnet, a Jean Monnet for a dangerous and jingoistic world, and that, uh, you know, you needed a commercial union, you needed a kind of a, not, not quite a customs union, but a preferential trade deal of some sort among the, com the countries of the, the British Empire, some of whom were already beginning to go on, on their own way, the Aussies, the Canadians, they're already heading off towards full statehood. Could they be kept tethered to the mother country in some way that would be good uh, for everybody? And he says, we need this commercial union because that's what's necessary for closer political relations. And so, you know, and that was important because otherwise the UK risked not being able to rival Germany in particular, but also the United States in a dangerous world. And so there's, a huge rumpus about this. I mean, he's still a liberal unionist, but the Conservative Party also splits on this, and then there's an election in 1906 that they, that they lose. And Balfour, the Conservative Prime Minister, is trying desperately to hold his party together. Uh, he says here in a letter to the Duke of Devonshire, whose brother had been murdered in the Phoenix Park a few years ago, and so he was a liberal unionist as well. He says to him, look, if our government falls, we're going to be in this ludicrous, embarrassing position of having to say that on the chief point that divides us, we hadn't made up our own mind and could not therefore pretend to give a decided lead to anybody else. So the Tory party does have a history when it comes to these things. And his, his, his solution was brilliant. He said, and nobody understood it, that's why it was brilliant. Uh, he said, we want fiscal freedom. Now, fiscal freedom meant we should do trade deals while disregarding free trade doctrine. So they wouldn't be, lib they wouldn't be doctrinaire free traders when going out and doing free trade deals. Okay, so they, they should disregard the free trade doctrine. They should put in tariffs, but they shouldn't have protection as their primary object. object. So nobody really knew what that meant. And this was his, his uh, attempt at keeping the party together. And yes, a historian comments that he was a great believer in verbal, for, verbal formulas as a means of resolving genuine conflicts of belief. And this is a nice quote from this fellow Coates here. So he, he actually has some success for a while. The Duke of Devonshire eventually does quit the, quit the cabinet, but he isolated him initially from the doctrinaire free trade free traders. And this, this success rested in part on the Duke's inability to understand the precise differences between Balfour's position and Chamberlain's. Uh, in this way, the Duke was in distinguished company, including many other leading politicians, members of the public, and even the monarch himself. So the Tory party has a history when it comes to the question of how should Britain deal economically with foreigners, you know? But the point is that the EU also has a history. Uh, the EU comes from a very specific history and the, the, the institutional shape of the EU and the way that the EU thinks about policies, the way that the EU is reacting to Brexit, they all reflect that history uh, also. Uh, 
So let me just say something about that. I mean, the most obvious thing to say about the EU, of course, is that its history in large part reflects the two world wars. That's an argument to which many people in Britain have often been allergic. Um, dare I say it, and now I'm skirting perilously close to local matters, but dare I say it, despite the fact that some people might think that the UK itself uh, is a good example of Europe as peace project. But, you know, I'll leave that hanging and we can discuss that, may, or maybe not. Um, but this is a nice quote uh, from a memo to David Cameron uh, early on in Cameron's uh, prime ministership. You know, we must assure that our armistice say commemoration does not give any support to the myth that European integration was the result of the two world wars. You know, it's, that's quite a statement, you know. At least it seems like quite a statement if you're in France or in Germany. I mean, they, quite, they can't quite believe it when they, when they read this kind of uh, thing. So that's, that's the most obvious way in which European history shaped the European project. With industrial warfare, war just became too expensive. You know, it just became too costly. 9% of the German population, not even a, of, you know, the men of military age, 9% of the population of Germany died during uh, World War uh, II. And there are very high casualty rates elsewhere as well. So that's one point to make. But the other point, and the deeper point, and maybe a point that I could make in an audience where there are various trade unionists present, is that the precise shape that European integration takes also affects its history, uh, also uh, reflects its history. In particular, there's this point that the EU, EU is supranational, and that's what the Brits have never really liked. They've, they've always said, you know, free trade is great, but why do we need the Commission? Why do we need the Court of Justice? Why do we need all these institutions that constrain us? Why do we need this collective decision-making thing that means that we might be left in a minority on an issue that we might care about? That's exactly what Theresa May spells out very clearly in this quotation uh, from her speech in Florence in September 2017. So why is the EU supranational? Why isn't it like NAFTA? the North American Free Trade uh, Association that just has three offices in each of the three capitals and the ministers meet every once in a while and they have a couple of technical working groups to sort out you know, how you, you know, deal with imports of avocados or whatever else it is and that's it. They don't have any of the paraphernalia that we have in Europe but there's a reason why we have it. And again, that reflects European history. So first of all, and this is the, I suppose the most obvious point, I mean Europe has been in decline since the turn of the 20th century, you know? Uh, so this is the share of uh, Europe, uh, the, the Europe's share, Western Europe's share of world GDP. But of course, a lot of the rest of the world's GDP also belonged to Europe in those days, because uh, in those days, 84% of the Earth's surface was uh, controlled by Europeans. And it was all downhill since then. Now, here's a very good quote uh, by Maurice Faure, and I think we, we should sort of Say well done, Morris, because this was actually quite prescient back in 1957. You know, back, back then, both the Brits and the French thought of themselves as great powers. That was about to be, I mean, well, maybe not in 57. 56 is Suez, isn't it? So by 57, I suppose, they were already learning the lesson. But, you know, but maybe some were slower than others. You know, but he says, look, there aren't four great powers. There are two, the Americans and the Russians. You know, and, then, you know, and there will be China by the end of the century. And, you know, you, you have to take your hat off uh, to four for that. And he says, it's up to us as to whether there'll be a fourth great power, uh, Europe, you know. So the issue was, would Europe still be relevant in a world that was changing all around them? And so there was always a geopolitical uh, aspect to European integration, and that required certain sorts of structures. But there are also domestic policy reasons why European integration was uh, supranational. So this is basically Europe reacting to the disaster of the 1930s. So the Great Depression, uh, protectionism, the rise of nationalism, and all that kind of thing. So what did it require? It required Keynesian macroeconomics to stabilize economies. It needed welfare states, so you didn't have people you know, on the streets of Berlin if they lost their jobs, you know, getting ever more uh, radicalized. There were growth strategies that were put in place that involved what, I suppose, in the 1990s in Ireland we called social partnership. The rest of Europe did that in the 1950s and 1960s. There were bargains where the workers moderated their wage demands, and then in return the employers invested the resulting profits in local industry, thus providing jobs and growth. Uh, and the state is basically playing a facilitating role in bringing these partners together, making the bargain stick, uh, throwing in things like the welfare state to buy off various constituencies, and so on. So, that's the, so the state, the role of the state is increasing during this period. 
Agriculture is still very important uh, in, in various uh, European countries. And what that means is that you know, there's no country in Europe that's going to have a free trade deal that doesn't involve uh, agricultural interests being protected. So they all have agricultural policies that keep uh, prices high, with one exception, which I'll get to, uh, to keep farming incomes high. Mm. So if you're going to have free trade, you have two choices. You can either have free trade in industrial goods only, and you all keep your own agricultural policies, or you can have free trade involving everything, but then instead of having national agricultural policies, you have to have a European agricultural policy. And the point is that an industry-only free trade deal was never going to work because countries like Italy and France wouldn't have had a lot to gain from that, or indeed the Netherlands. You know, the, the Germans might have been happy, the others were never going to be happy. And so you were immediately pushed into a situation where a European-wide free trade deal was going to have to involve agriculture, that was going to have to involve a common agricultural policy, that was going to involve supranational decision-making structures you know, to, to, to determine the level of price support uh, and all the rest of it. And there's an even more fundamental point, which is that they decided after the disaster of the interwar period that they had to have free trade at the level of Europe, but that that free trade couldn't come at the expense of these nascent uh, welfare states, these nascent mixed economies. You had to have free trade, but you had to stop destructive regulatory races to the bottom. Uh, this is Alan, Alan Millward's uh, famous argument. So, for example, in the negotiations about the Treaty of Rome, the French are very worried because they already have a 40-hour week, 40 week. The Germans have a 48-hour week. Now, they're all working the same number of hours. That means that the French are getting more overtime which is a cost disadvantage for the French car manufacturers. So they, they don't like this, right? So we're going to need fair competition, right? So they say, look, we all have to standardize on the same working week and the same overtime rules. In, in France, women, in theory, had equal pay with men. That was not the case in other countries. Again, the French say, look, we have to have this for everybody. It has to be fair competition. And over and over again, you see this kind of concern about what we nowadays call level playing fields. And so, in the Treaty of Rome, you get not just the abolition of tariffs, not just the abolition of quotas, but you know, we're going to have close cooperation in the social field, including labor law, working conditions, vocational training, social security, you know, prevention of accidents, all this kind of stuff. Maybe a little bit ironic. These people are not socialists, right? These people are nearly all Christian Democrats, actually. They're quite conservative Christian Democrats. And the British Labour Party says, you know, this is a capitalist plot. But these are Christian Democrats of a certain sort, and they've lived through the 1930s, and they, need, they know what you need to do to avoid a repeat performance. Um, yeah, uh, so in the Treaty of Rome, you know, the French get equal pay for men and women in there. Uh, they also uh, get in, you know, we shall endeavor to, not quite con constraining, but we'll endeavor to maintain the existing equivalence between, pay, between paid, paid uh, holiday schemes. And then there's a long, long protocol, which I won't bother reading out, where it basically says, uh, we're going to try to all have the same overtime rules, essentially. Uh, and we're going to try to converge on the same rules as soon as possible. But if the Germans and so on don't converge to French standards, then the French will have a safeguard clause, and they'll be able to protect their industries if they're suffering from unfair competition. You know, now, in the end, that never had to come into effect, because growth in Germany is so rapid during this period that everybody's wages, everybody's living standards, everybody's welfare states are, are expanding. And so, it's a prob and so the problem goes away on its own. But they were very, very concerned about this. And that's, that's the raison d'etre, in a sense, the original raison d'etre of the EEC as it was, is to combine the continent-wide effects of free trade with the prevention of destructive regulatory races to the bottom. The, the certain type of British politician has never liked that, but for continentals, this is absolutely essential. Okay, yeah, and, and I mean, this is just saying that they didn't just do free trade, they did a common agricultural policy and, and social funds and, and all sorts of other stuff. Okay, how did the Brits respond to this? Well, I think there is a legacy of the 19th century here that's important, and I'm not going to talk about imperial nostalgia, I'll leave that to Fintan O'Toole. Um, they, you know, the empire, but the empire was important for them. Now, so this is just a pretty picture, so I'm just putting that, it's a pretty picture. So, first of all, they do sort of soft persuasion, right? So, all of the dominions, you know, we should trade more with each other, you know? So, that, that's what they did in the 1920s. But then in October 31, uh, Joe Chamberlain's son, uh, uh, Neville becomes Chancellor of the Exchequer. I think it might have been the very start of November. The election is October. I think he becomes 
Chancellor in November, and almost immediately he introduces what his dad would have called imperial uh, preference. So tariffs go up, and they go up a lot more on uh, foreign goods than on goods from the empire. So there's a switch to protection, uh, and the protection is overwhelmingly against foreign goods, not against British Empire or British Commonwealth goods. And uh, coinciding with that switch, there is uh, a big increase, as you would expect, in the share of British imports coming from the empire. And in a recent paper with the two Allens there and Marcus in Vienna, we've shown that the vast majority of that switch towards empire can, in fact, be explained by the uh, imperial preferences that Chamberlain uh, brought in. Okay, so, so now Britain has become, the British Empire, the British Commonwealth is becoming more self-sufficient as a unit. Problem is, so is everybody else. Uh, if you read across the table here, you'll see that, for example, in France, the share of French imports coming from the empire is going up. The share of French exports to the empire is going up. And it's also true of countries that don't have empires yet, but that hope to someday, and that soon, in fact, will. In other words, world trade is becoming more balkanized during this period. And at the time and immediately afterwards, this was seen as being incredibly dangerous because essentially trade is being viewed more and more by these countries as in, in geopolitical terms, in terms of national uh, security. So uh, in 1941, the famous New Zealand economist Condliffe says, you know, by now it's so obvious as to hardly need statement that this sort of bilateral trade balkanized, fragmented trade focused on imperial blocks was taking on aggressive and destructive aspects as international rivalries were sharpened in the era of what is now known as pre-belligerency. And I suppose, you know, you can think about it in terms of, you know, uh, a Japanese liberal who's saying, you know, in the context where, of, of Japan in the early 30s where there are mad nationalists just around the corner, he's saying, look, lads, we should, you know, import our food and raw materials by exporting our, our, our manufactured products and our silk and so on to America. And they're saying, yeah, but that's all very well, but, you know, we're not able to export our products to America or, or the British Empire or anywhere else because they're all discriminating against us. And it becomes that much more difficult for the liberal to win that fight against the nationalists. And eventually they go out and they decide to grab these foods and raw materials that they need rather than buying them on the open market. And so in 1941, when, so they, uh, Roosevelt's not at war yet, but he soon will be, when, when, Winston and FDR meet uh, off the coast of Newfoundland. Uh, they issue something called the Atlantic Charter, and it's an eight-point plan you might see as being sort of the war aims in some sense of the grand geopolitical sort of war aims of the what will soon become allies. And the, the fourth point is, look, after the war, whether you're big or small, whether you're a victor or whether you, uh, you're vanquished, you'd all get access on equal terms, underlined, on equal terms, to the trade and the raw materials of the world that you need, right? So there won't be discrimination in world trade. There won't be these imperial preferences. There won't be these trade blocks. We're all gonna trade with each other on a non-discriminatory non basis. And that's why Article 1 of the GATT, and it is Article 1, it's not Article 42 or 35, it's Article 1 of the GATT is what's known as the most favored nation. Uh, clause. It's the non-discrimination clause. So it basically says that any advantage or favour or privilege that you grant to anybody, you're going to have to grant immediately to everybody else. You know, if you lower a tariff on a good coming from Belgium, you're going to have to lower it on that same good coming from everywhere. You cannot discriminate. Why most favoured nation? Well, because if I'm your most favoured nation, if I'm your most favoured nation, then you, then you can't have another nation who's more more favoured than me, you see? That's, that's the, the logic of the phrase. It's a slightly awkward phraseology, but that's what it means. So basically, you're not allowed to discriminate anymore. Okay, and there are, however, one or two exceptions. And they're at the heart of uh, current debates about Brexit. And the, well, they, they had grandfather clauses for existing imperial preferences, not just the British ones, but the French. Uh, the Dutch and, and the Portuguese and so on, okay? So that was grandfathered in. Uh, the Americans always hated this and always wanted to get rid of it. But basically the exceptions that were more relevant are contained in Article 24 of the GATT. So basically, it's good if neighbours cooperate and so we're not going to stop you from forming a customs union or a free trade area. So what is a customs union? So a customs union 
basically means we get rid of all duties and other restrictive reg regulations, like quantitative restrictions. Uh, they're going to be eliminated, eliminated with respect to substantially all the trade, brackets sick, but substantially all of the trade. That's an important phrase that became important during the Brexit debates at one point, that we could, for reasons that we could go into later. So you, you get rid of all of your, your, your tariffs and quotas on, on, on trade between the countries in the customs union, but you also have substantially the same duties and other regulations of commerce vis-a-vis -vis trade with the rest of the world. So it's not just that we get rid of tariff barriers within the customs union, we have the same external tariffs vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. That's a customs union. A free trade area is the first bit without the second bit. You get rid of tariffs on goods coming from each other's countries, but you don't have to have the common external trade policy. Now this, now can we all guess which the British would have preferred? The British always preferred this to this, right? Because, because this, this basically meant they could continue to discriminate in favor of the empire because they could have their own independent external trade policy. This meant they have to have the same trade policy as everybody else, right? So, and it, of course it seems you know, we have more flexibility, what's not to like, you know? So why would anybody ever go for uh, a customs union rather than a free trade area? And the answer is, of course, that if Britain and France do a free trade deal, and so now the French are not gonna put tariffs on imports of British lamb, well, that's what they've agreed. But they haven't agreed not to put tariffs on imports of New Zealand lamb, because they don't have a free trade deal with the New Zealanders, right? And if the British go off and do a free trade deal with the New Zealanders and admit their lamb duty free, then that lamb can come duty free into Britain, and the French are not going to want it to be imported duty free into France. So they're going to insist on having people at the border checking that the lamb is in fact from Britain and not from New Zealand, right? So that's why you might want to have a customs union rather than a free trade area. You know, it avoids uh, uh, rules, uh, it avoids checks at the border for what are known as, as rules of origin. There's an anecdote from the 1960s, the Irish sent off a delegation to London. We had a free trade deal with Britain at that point, uh, the Anglo-Irish Free Trade Agreement signed in 1965. Uh, and the Irish were very worried about imports of Australian lamb or, or Australian beef coming in, you know, because we wanted to protect our farmers. It was okay to import the British stuff, but not the stuff from, from the Empire or the Commonwealth. And Dennis, he, and we said, could you please mark clearly on all British goods made in Britain or made in the UK? That way it'll be easier for our inspectors. And Dennis Healy got very irritated finally. And he said, do you want me to stamp made in Britain on the balls of every bullock shipped to Ireland? Whereupon Paddy Hillary said, well, bullocks don't have balls. So, it's, uh, if, you're a, so if you're a city man like me, that's a, that's a, a very useful anecdote. Um, but maybe it can help other people to remember the difference between these two things. Because the crucial distinction in all the Brexit debates has been about you know, what, you know, free trade areas versus customs unions. With free trade areas, you always have checks at the border to check that it's British beef and not Australian beef. All right. Um, after 1945, Britain's a very different place from the rest of the continent, not just because it hadn't been defeated. The British Empire was still very much present. Imperial preferences were still a core part of British economic policy. Uh, the Americans are very keen on European integration, and they tried to get us all to think about a customs union. And there's this uh, civil service group in London that, in 1947, think about this, and they say, yeah, well, it had nothing in its favour other than the damage that would be caused by being excluded from it which I think sums up perfectly a certain type of British attitude towards European integration. You're not in favour of it, but do you really want to be outside it if it happens? Because then you're going to lose your markets potentially in France and Germany. So what do you do? And the answer is, but they finally came up with this brilliant plan, Plan G. So why is it called Plan G? Well, because there was a memo went in to the Board of Trade that had six op items and they were all discarded. And so then the seventh item, you know, that the, they came up with this thing. And it was brilliant because it managed to satisfy all of Britain's red lines. That was what was great about it. They would have an industrial free trade area, free trade area only, industrial goods only, with all of Europe, all of the OEEC, uh, including the European Union. And this is brilliant because it meant that they could continue to export industrial goods to the new EEC, 
It meant that they wouldn't have to include agriculture, so they could continue to do their own agricultural policies, which were very different then. I don't have really time to go into that. They had deficiency payments in Britain rather than uh, tariffs protecting farmers. Uh, and they could continue to have their own free trade deals with the, with the Commonwealth. So what's not to like? Well, from a British point of view, this was brilliant, but they forgot that they had negotiators on the other side who had their own interests. And from the point of view of the French or the Dutch or the Italians, there was nothing to like here because you know, they were trying to sell agricultural goods. So this was never going to fly. So they were so fixated on what would work in London that they completely forgot what would uh, be required to do a deal with the other side. They were very uh, optimistic going in. Uh, yes, I mean, obviously we'll be able to do this on our own terms. And this is just a quote from a, a, politi from a historian. And it was, it was, the book was published before everything that has happened recently. So I just, I just note that he just described Plan G as an attempt, a British attempt to have their cake and eat it, you know. So this goes back a long, a long time. Okay, so they, they stay out. But things aren't going well. This is British GDP per capita, relative to GDP per capita in France and Germany. So they're doing really pretty terribly. Uh, this is partly why they eventually decide that they will join. Uh, they want to be exposed, in a sense, to Brit German competition to force their businesses to up their game. Uh, the American angle is also important here. The Americans do not like the European free trade area at all. It discriminates against American goods and it offers no political benefits. They're all in favor of the EEC because it also discriminates against American goods, but offers substantial political benefits. And eventually, Macmillan realizes that if he wants to uh, stay uh, America's best friend, they better do something about it. And as we know, they eventually uh, join. Now, at this stage, I'm going to fast forward the narrative because the final bit of the jigsaw, you know, that you need to uh, understand to understand what's going on here today is this single market thing that was a British invention to a large extent. Arthur Cofield was Mrs. Thatcher's right-hand man. He goes to Brussels and becomes Jacques Delors' right-hand man. And his white paper in uh, 1985 on the single market is brilliant. And you can download it. And the logic is very simple. There are physical barriers to trade. And they are required because we still have technical barriers to trade and fiscal barriers to trade. Okay, if you want to get rid of physical barriers to trade, i.e. border controls, you have to get rid of the technical barriers to trade and the fiscal barriers to trade that require those border controls. Now, the fiscal barriers to trade have to do with things like VAT. I'm not going to go into them because uh, I don't have time. Uh, technical barriers to trade is pretty straightforward. You know, back in the bad old days, I mean, a lot of you kind of were kids. I suppose there are a good few young people here in the audience. You know, back in the bad old days, there would be different regulations about, let's say, children's car seats in every country. Uh, so in order to check, uh, you need, so, you know, your, your France, you have your rules about children's car seats. You know, uh, are the German car seats that you're importing, can they be legally sold in France? Well, maybe not. So you need to check to see if they're in conformity with your own regulations. Those controls at the borders are costly. What's the solution? The solution is to have the same rules for car seats. It's not rocket science. You know, that's, that's all the single market uh, really is. And uh, Cofield uh, basically says, look, you know, these barriers, they, they, they cost time and money. So it's a very pragmatic Anglo-Saxon uh, reason for having common rules and regulations. And the good news is that thanks to Northern Ireland and the protocol, we now have a very handy list of all of the uh, rules and regulations that you need to keep uh, trade uh, frictionless and to avoid barriers at borders. They're contained in this 69-page Annex 5 of the Northern Irish Protocol, and you can just point and click and Google and so on, and you can see what all of these regulations are. So, for example, you know, one of the hundreds of regulations in those 69 pages is directed to 2009 48 EC about children's toys, and that goes on for pages and pages as well. But what it does is, for example, it sets limits on how much arsenic you might want to have in a children's toy, which seems like a reasonable thing to want to do. And it also spreads out, for example, traceability requirements, which also seems like a reasonable thing to want to do. And the point is, if we all have the same rules and regulations, then we don't have to check stuff coming from each other's countries. That's all the single market is, folks. It's not that difficult. So the EU has a history as well, and it shapes its attitudes, it shapes its attitudes towards the negotiations. And let me just say a few things here. Oh, gee. Can't I really don't want to. Okay. So first of all, it was bloody difficult 
to negotiate the single market. And there was only 12 member states at the time when it was being negotiated. You know, there's all these vested interests that have to be faced down who are going to lose out. All these little, you know, local monopoly producers of this, that and the other thing who are going to be exposed to pan-European competition. So actually to, to, to negotiate this thing was a huge achievement. And so if you unpick any one part of it, the whole edifice ends up potentially coming down. So you can't allow cherry picking. That's where it comes from. It's just self-preservation. If you get rid of particular parts of the single market, the whole thing will unravel. And the EEC or the EU as it now is, it's only a bunch of treaties. That's all it is. You know, there are still the member states as we see with Brexit. They, they existed before, they, they will exist afterwards, right? The only thing that makes the EU, the EU is the treaties and the fact that they're respected. And if you get rid of them, then, it, then it's gone. So, so they can't allow uh, cherry picking. It's very good for the EU that it controls its own rules. It has its own rules about children's toys. And that means that if you're a company, no matter how big, no matter how powerful, you could be Google or Facebook or anybody else, if you want to play in our market, you play by our, our rules. I mean, that's the only bit of significant power, I think, that Europe has at the global level. We're, we're, not, we're not a military power, you know, we're not a foreign policy player, we're all over the place in foreign policy, but this is real power. So they're not going to give up this. So they're not going to have a situation where the British government tell them what they can and can't do with their own rules. That's just self, simple self-preservation as well. And thirdly, and this came into focus very sharply uh, in that frantic second half of November when this protocol uh, it came on stream and we realised that it was all UK in part all of a sudden. You know, they're very concerned about level playing fields for reasons that I hope are clear given what I've said. So, so, so a lot of European attitudes were completely predetermined. So they have a history and we have a history too. I'm not going to tell you about your history, but let me tell, me a little bit, tell you a little bit about Irish economic history. So this is income per capita in 1926. This is growth between 1926 and, and 2001. You will observe that countries that were rich in 1926 have a lower growth rate than countries that were poor in 1926. In other words, in this sample of Western European countries, uh, there's convergence. Poor countries grow more rapidly than rich countries. That's just an empirical fact. And you'll see that Ireland is bang on the line. We grew over the 75-year period exactly as quickly as we should have done. But the timing was off. Our performance in the interwar period was average, basically average. Uh, we weren't unusually protectionist. We were protectionist, but not unusually so. We did very badly, but not unusually so. It's the 50s and 60s that are awful. So here's the same sort of scatter plot. So, uh, and you see that's, that's, that's the line that gives you the average relationship between your, your income in 1950 and your growth over the next 10 years. And we're way below the line. So we were very poor. We should have been growing at Italian rates. You know, we're growing at, you know, Scottish rates, you know, or, you know, practically American rates, hopeless. Now, some of you will have heard of T.K. Whitaker, Sean Lamas, the wonderful opening, all of that stuff. Fast forward to the 1960s, we're still way below the line. You know, we're still way underperforming. We only stop underperforming after 1973. Okay? Oh, yes, and by the way, yeah, by the way, yeah, this is just for the, for the locals. Uh, so you'll note that over this period as a whole, we're underperforming, but actually, so are the Northern Irish, so are the Welsh, so are the Scottish. It's almost as if we were all one big kind of economy, with the Irish bit just a one regional component of a big British and Irish economy, and it wasn't doing very well, you know? And essentially what happens in the Republic after 73 is we gradually decouple from the British and Irish economy, and things start improving. And they start improving almost immediately. So this is after 73. I mean, 73 to 90 is not a good period, folks, for anybody who remembers it, right? It was awful. But we're already a little bit above the line, and here we are, you know, uh, during the 1990s, and you know we are way overperforming, you know, and uh, not everywhere in the British Isles uh, was at that time. And this is just showing uh, incomes per capita uh, as as a share of UK incomes per capita. So this is the Irish income per capita here, and then oops, something changes, right? You know that's very dramatic, right? So you know, and what's interesting, you know, is that Northern Ireland is obviously part of the e e EU as well. And so is Scotland, and so is Wales, right? But it looks like it did more for us than it did for the other sort of regional economies within the British and Irish economy. And I would submit, my view is, this must be 
something to do with our independence and the fact that we were able to have our own policy mix that suited us and we can discuss whether this was a morally glorious policy mix or whether it was very good or very bad or whatever, but it worked, you know. So I think from an Irish point of view, you know, our, our independence would never have worked as well as it did without EU membership. Our EU membership would never have worked as well as it did without independence. So for us, the two things have always complemented each other. You know, and they complement each other, not just economically, but, uh, but, but politically as well, because it gave us a place around the table that we didn't have before. I remember I, I, we moved to Brussels in, in 73. My dad was a diplomat. And uh, a little while later, George Pompidou died. And uh, they, they flew the flags at half-mast in the European school. And uh, then a few m months after that, Erskine Childers died. And I was in a pretty bad mood going into the, the school that morning anyway, because the Belgian news had said he was only the second Protestant president of Ireland. I was thinking, yeah, well, that's true, but there was only four. You know, that, 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 doesn't, that, that doesn't seem like a bad batting average to me, you know. And, and, I, went, and I went in, and I went in, and, and the flags were not flying at half-mast. So I, I was 11 or something. I knocked on the door of the headmaster and said, put the bloody, you know, flags on. And, and he put the flags at half-mast. And in a way, that kind of symbolizes, you know, for a little kid, what membership at the EEC means. You can be as small as Ireland, but you are a fully paid up member of this club, and your country has the same rights as everybody else. Right, so basically the idea of the book is that if you want to understand where Brexit comes from, it's not enough to, to understand the psychodrama of the Tory party, although that's a part of the story. You have to zoom out a little bit. You have to understand where Europe is coming from as much as where Britain is coming from, because it's the precise supranational nature of Europe that that certain bit of the British establishment has always been allergic to. You also need to understand Irish history, and then you have these three histories that come together and collide over the past two years, and they collide together in the context where these distinctions between free trade areas uh, customs unions and single markets really matter. Okay, let me finish by just saying a little bit, of, I have about 10 minutes left, don't I? So let me just finish by saying something about, um, about the causes of Brexit and, and talk a little bit about, about history uh, here. Well, you know, you know imagine that in you know, 50 years time, you know, we're, we're teaching our students the causes of Brexit. I can, imagine, I can imagine people drawing up boxes like this, you know, uh, based on perhaps today's, uh, t today's debate. So, you know, there's this huge debate, not just about Brexit, but about Trump. Is it cultural or economic, right? And that, that question itself is hugely ideological, right? If you're a certain sort of person on the left, you can't bear to think that it might be economic, because in some sense that would be justifying the people who voted for Trump. You know, a certain sort of American just cannot bring themselves to think that. You know, it must just be that they're hillbillies. You know, there was that book, Hillbilly Elegy, right, uh, that basically said it's all their fault because they're all dysfunctional and, and so on. And, you know, and to which the response might be they may be dysfunctional, but it may be because they don't have jobs anymore, you know. So, but it's a very, I mean, and I'm, not say, and I'm not saying it's either or. In fact, that's precisely what I'm saying. It's probably not either or. <laughs> These things are always complicated, right? That's my instinct, right? Um, but we could also think about arguments for Brexit, you know, about, about why Brexit happened that be purely focused on Britain, right? It's just, you know, the Tory party, it's their nostalgia for empire, it's, you know, the legacy of Mrs. Thatcher, it's, you know, whatever, whatever you're having itself. But there probably would also be people who'd be saying, no, actually, you know what, you can't think about Brexit in isolation. It happened in the same year as Donald Trump. The next year you have the French National Front almost, uh, you know, making it to the second round. Uh, you have, I, was it in 2017? I think the Austrian FPÖ makes it to government as part of a coalition. Then 2018, we have Silvini. So there's something going on here, folks, you know? So then you have this sort of nice sort of two by two uh, matrix. So you can think about cultural and international arguments that might involve things like, you know, fake news and all this kind of thing. You can imagine an Anglo-centric uh, economic argument like George Osborne's austerity packages, um, you know, probably people are going to tend to mostly focus on you know, this one. So if you, if, you, if you want to believe that, this is the book for you. It's a nice, satisfying rant to curl up with uh, over, the, you know, over the Christmas holiday. It, it, it's brilliantly funny, I have to say. It's a brilliantly funny polemic. Um, so so that's, that's one option. And, and then the polar opposite option is an argument that says this is this is nothing to do with Britain. It's just got to do with how you know this country is responding to the same globalization-related shocks as is you know uh, Trump's heartland, 
and the, the formerly industrial parts of France uh, and so on. Let me just put up uh, one slide quoting myself from 1999 where we say, look at, uh, you know, people tend to assume that we're always going to have globalization forever and that's not what history shows unless politicians care about who gains and who loses they might be forced by the electorate to stop efforts to strengthen the global economy and perhaps even to dismantle them. Now, the point is not that we were prophetic in 1999 at all, actually. It was a long time ago, right? The point is that there was a reason why we framed our book that way in 1999. So it was a book about the anti-globalization backlash of the late 19th century, where you had globalization, you had winners and losers. The losers included, for example, European landowners, and where those landowners had enough power, they used that power to have tariffs to protect themselves from American wheat and Argentinian beef and, and all the rest of it. And on the other side of the Atlantic, the losers were maybe native-born American workers who were facing competition from migrants from first Ireland and then Sicily and then further east. And you can see immigration barriers, immigration restrictions be put in place throughout that point in time. So that's what the book is about. It was about a big example of anti-globalization backlash, but we framed it this way because in the 1990s, there was a huge debate among American economists about whether rage inequality in, in America in the 1990s was due to competition with Asia, right? Uh, and the reason that people were worried about that was this, right? So this is, this is the, the, the average wage or the, or the median wage maybe in America, right? It goes up, it goes up, it goes up, and then, oh, something happens, right? So sometime between, you know, the breakup of the Beatles and, you know, whatever, Saturday Night Fever or something, you know, something, something bad happens, right? And I, mean, and I was young then, you know, I was young then, right? And, 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 and something happened, and they only got back to where they were about 10 years ago, and they're only about 6% ahead of where they were in the early 70s then. So, you know, there was, so that's why we framed our book in the 1990s the way we did. It was already there for everybody to see. There'd already been Ross Perot, there'd already been Pat Buchanan, you know, uh, but we just, we always sort of got away with it. You know, Perot doesn't win and then the, the, the party goes on and, you know, we had all of these uh, alarms and we always got away with it and, and, and now we're, we're really dealing with the consequences. It's important that Europeans not be too, uh, uh, what's the word, superior about the problems that Britain is uh, going through right now. I was living in France in 2005 in this little village uh, during the French referendum campaign on, on the constitutional treaty. Uh, the young people in the village were all voting no. I would go up to Sciences Po in Paris to earn a bit of money and the young people in Sciences Po were all voting yes, you know, and, and the thing was voted down and there's a very, very clear uh, class divide, you know, so 35% uh, of professionals vote no. 79% uh, of blue-collar workers vote no, right? Yeah, and, and, and then we had a vote in, in the Republic uh, a year or two later on the Lisbon Treaty. And again, I think in Dunleary, there was a 60% vote yes. And in uh, where you come from out there in Fairhouse, it was 60% vote no, I think. Exactly the same class divide, you know? So it's not as though this is just a British story. This is a very basic, general story that all of our democracies uh, have been... Uh, going through. So what's going on? And there's lots of there's lots of things going on. And I think one of the things that's going on is actually nothing to do with Euro uh, Europe. Actually, I think one of the things that's going on is China. Now, China obviously can't explain why their wages stopped growing in 1973. Okay, that probably has to do with lots of things. Uh, but I, it does explain a lot of uh, what's gone on in the last uh, 10 years. There's a fantastic series of papers by. Uh, David Autor, uh, David Dorn, and uh, what's his name, uh, Gordon, whatever his name, Hansen, uh, in America, where they look at regional uh, performances in America. They look at sort of county level data or maybe commuting zone level data, and they look at the industrial structure in these counties. But they look at the industrial structure in the late 80s, so before the China shock really hit. So they're looking to see whether in that region in America you're producing stuff that was about to be all of a sudden subjected to competition from the Chinese. And what they find is that if you are producing the wrong sort of thing in that sense, then in the years that followed, you were going to lose a lot of manufacturing jobs, and among non-manufacturing workers, their wages were going to fall. You know? So there's a 
there's a clear, clear correlation there. It, the, the correlation is, is also there for, for health outcomes. It's also there for political outcomes. So if you're one of these, if you're, oh God, if you're one of these, it doesn't matter. If you're one of these um, uh, regions, if you're already a Democrat region, you're more likely to vote for, for um, Bernie Sanders or maybe flip all the way to the Tea Party. And if you're already a, a Republican uh, cons uh, uh, region, you're more likely to go uh, for a hard right uh, Republican. Okay, so, so we know that the China shock uh, has had a lot to do with both economic inequality in America and with political polarization. And there's more recent work, and I had scatter plots to show you, that show that the China shock also correlates very strongly with the Brexit vote, actually. So you can do correlations between the Brexit vote and the China shock, it's there very clearly. You can do correlations between the Brexit vote and immigrants from Eastern Europe, and it's hardly there at all. It's very, very weak, actually. It's very clear that, that trade has more to do with the Brexit vote in the north of England than immigration from the east of Europe. And the second thing that uh, is strongly correlated with the Brexit vote is austerity. You know, because we know that after 2010, George Osborne embarked on an austerity drive whose purpose wasn't just to get rid of the budget deficit, which is a reasonable thing to do. We had to do that in the Republic because we had no choice because nobody was lending to us, right? But his agenda was to actually shrink the size of the state. And if you correlate various measures of austerity against the Brexit vote uh, at the regional level in, in Britain, you find a very, very strong vote. And especially in those communities that were simultaneously suffering from the China shock. So the point is that you have globalization, uh, vulnerable communities are becoming more vulnerable, that's when they need their safety nets, and then that's when their safety nets are taken away. And it's maybe not so surprising that people just go ballistic and end up uh, voting for you know, something to change, anything to change. Um, so those are the structural arguments that you could point to. Globalization, austerity, Maybe, you know, British cultural factors, maybe Russian interference, you know. The final thing I want to say is that it's not just about structural factors. There's also a big role for chance and a big role for contingency. There's an absolutely brilliant blog post by Dominic Cummings that I would heartily recommend to anybody who's interested in Brexit. So he was the mastermind behind Vote Leave. It's a very honest and a very insightful uh, blog post about how the referendum was won from his point of view. And he has one line that uh, expresses what I want to say beautifully. He says, Hist in history, there are no big whys. You know, there's no big whys. It's all about branching histories. In other words, history could branch this way. It could branch that way. Well, and tonight, isn't it obvious that it could branch in many different ways? And it's very little factors, small margins, lead it to branch one way uh, or the other. So he talks about, for example, Boris Johnson's last minute decision to, to, to campaign for Remain rather than Leave. If it hadn't have been Boris heading up the Leave ticket, it might have been Nigel Farage that probably would have scared off lots of middle class voters, uh, he thinks. You know, uh, you also want to think about the context. 2015-16 is a terrible year uh, to be trying to convince people to stay in the European Union because there's a migration crisis, which is a real crisis, and it's a complete shambles. And there's the Eurozone crisis, which you know, had been ongoing for a long time already and was also a complete shambles. At that stage, the British economy had recovered from the crisis because the Bank of England had done the necessary. Osborne wasn't helping, but the bank was doing what it had to do. America had recovered a lot earlier because the bank was doing what it needed to do there, and Obama was stimulating the economy. The Eurozone had slammed on the fiscal brakes in 2010, and the ECB was always much too conservative. Uh, and so, you know, we hadn't recovered by 2016. Kind of extraordinary, you know, uh, an extraordinary failure. Uh, if you think, if you look at the Eurozone outside of Germany uh, specifically, and so it was easy then to argue that. Uh, the EU was a club that you shouldn't be uh, scared uh, to leave, you know? And so I think that's the, the, where I really want to end up, that yes, there are structural factors, and if I was teaching you know, a class in 50 years' time and we were asking why did Brexit happen, I probably would talk about those structural factors. I'm enough of an economist and a social scientist to believe that structure matters. But because I'm also an economic historian, I probably also believe that chance and contingency matters because that's what historians tend to believe. And I suppose what's great about being an economic historian is we straddle that divide and that's what makes 
our field such uh, an interesting one. And I think there's a political message there to end up with, which is that you know what history tells you is that you know, we were all endowed with free will, and so were our leaders, and the choices that people make, for better or for worse, uh, end up really mattering, and that nothing is preordained. And that's not a bad thought to keep in mind in dangerous times. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kevin, and also very impressed that you continued flawlessly despite there's a few technological issues going on behind you, but thankfully we'll get those resolved in time for Katie. And um, so much to take in there, everything from China to a few um, interesting facts about bullocks. So a little bit of a, some, something for everyone there. I don't know if my um, university business in French would enable me to read the French version of your book yet, but I'm sure many of us will look forward to reading it in English when it comes out in, in January. And um, now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Kitty Hayward. And interesting that we haven't really heard very much about Northern Ireland yet because Dr. Kitty Hayward has been researching for more than 20 years the impact of the EU on the Irish border and on the peace process. And many of you would recognise her from giving evidence to various parliamentary committees. And so she's one of the leading voices here on the role of Northern Ireland in all of this. And hopefully we'll have her slides up and uh, ready to go very shortly. And hopefully the technology that they're going to propose for the border will be, uh, will be more... Something just as advanced as <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Thank you to Tom and thank you to Lisa for organising it all. Um, what I've decided to uh, focus on, um, concentrating really on Northern Ireland, um, I'm deeply honoured to be following Kevin and I'm not going to try and... Um, uh, pick up from where he left off, really, or where he left us. Um, I'm going to focus very directly on question Northern Ireland and what Lisa um, basically announced that I was going to talk about, <laughs> which is now is it down somewhere. So it was basically, Lisa said that I would talk about anti globalisation in Northern Ireland, which does follow on some, from some of the themes that Kevin finished on, uh, and also the question of where we are right now and what we might be facing. Uh, so bearing in mind, um, as Kevin noted at the end, that there's, there's so much uncertainty at the moment, I just want to take this opportunity to really pause and think about actually things we might have forgotten uh, in, the, uh, in the particular moment that we're in right now. So the first point is about why people voted for Brexit in Northern Ireland. Um, in many ways, this was viewed or can be viewed as a sort of anti-globalisation vote, certainly for the reasons Kevin was explaining, this was a factor, or can be seen to be a factor in Northern Ireland um, and the reasons why people voted the way they did. Um, across the UK, support for Brexit was uh, much more uh, clearly um, defined in, um, in working class areas um, and people with um, fewer qualifications. And this pattern continues into Northern Ireland. It's something that we've often, uh, that we readily forgot actually. So you see this in terms of people's qualifications, so those with postgrad um, qualifications are 80% uh, voting in favour of Remain, um, compared to those with no qualifications uh, voting 49% in favour of Remain, or, or less. And similarly, so you uh, see the same here in terms of the data in occupational um, in occupations, uh, professionals 78% in favour of Remain compared to those on, on benefits or semi-skilled professions, about 51-53%. A lot of this uh, question of anti-globalisation, why people feel wary of globalisation or connect the experience of globalisation to what they see in their daily lives, of course we've seen that this has been very much um, associated with the rise of um, anti-immigrant rhetoric and the fear of immigration. And look at this data uh, from um, the election survey carried out by John uh, Gary on the uh, Brexit referendum. We see that very clearly defined. I've put it in an unusual form for this graph, but I think it shows us very clearly that uh, those who strongly agree that immigration is good for the economy, good for society, 85% um, of those are voting in favour of Remain. And this goes all the way down to 24% of those voting in favour of Remain who think that immigration is a good thing. And you see um, almost the directly opposite uh, trends in terms of those voting in favour of Leave. So anti 
uh, or fear of immigration or concerns about immigration were certainly present in, in Northern Ireland in the vote um, for leave. Of course, this is true in GB as well, and this is why um, the, the, uh, the mantra of taking back control of borders became very powerful. Um, and notably, of course, that, that mantra has sat very uneasily with the question of what to do with the Irish border in particular, um, which we'll come on to in a minute. This is um, a survey from Coakley and Gary looking at why people voted the way they did in Northern Ireland. So setting aside some of that anti-globalization or potentially anti-globalization dynamics, what's much more of a clearer predictor of the way that people voted is surprise, surprise, um, community background and political preferences in Northern Ireland. Now, this, this is quite logical in many ways because post-agreement uh, politics in Northern Ireland, the way that the predominant political divide is being presented, it's very much, of course, in terms of unionist and nationalist, the idea of the two communities thesis. And we see this in the, in the way that people voted in the Brexit referendum as well. So, um, most clearly amongst, oh, sorry, amongst the Catholic population, um, oh, sorry, I'm not used to this. Uh, oh, there we go. So, Catholic population, 85% voting in favour of uh, Remain, according to this survey. Um, and then we see um, uh, those who have Irish identity, 88% in favour of Remain. Um, nationalist identity, 89% in favour of Remain, and those who, whose long-term preferred outcome for Northern Ireland is Irish unity, 85% in favour of Remain. And we see a much more, um, it's not a direct opposite to that, but a much more um, pro-leave sentiments amongst uh, Protestant community, those with Ulster identity in particular, um, unionists, and uh, the question of people's long-term preferred outcome. So, unsurprisingly, this becomes the dominant way of dealing with Brexit or responding to Brexit within Northern Ireland. This is an interesting point. So the question of the long-term future of Northern Ireland, um, what people would prefer to see, as I noted, only 15% of those in favour of Irish unity were voting for leave, so, um, uh, and we can imagine where that vote might be coming from. Some people who saw leave as hastening Irish unity. Um, in the middle, we see those in favour of the long-term solution for Northern Ireland being devolved status within the UK. And bear in mind that supporters of these, according to a Northern Ireland Life and Times survey, a, a large proportion of support for this comes from the Catholic population as well, so Catholic respondents. So the soft unionism in that is very clear. Um, this is what has set, been centred upon this idea of those supporters of the status quo. That's attempted to be built upon in the way that political parties have responded to Brexit here. This is really interesting in context of what we're facing now in terms of the DUP's decision. So those supporters of direct rule, now that's not a large portion of the population, that's probably about 14% or so. Those in favour of direct rule from London are those who are most strongly um, in favour of Brexit. Um, so the question is, what happened in political response to this particular vote? As I say very quickly, the um, class differences or educational differences or um, even preferences related to immigration, those were quickly set aside within Northern Ireland. Let's remind ourselves of the common ground that was created by the parties, not necessarily publicised. We saw the letter from McGuinness and Foster, of August 2016, setting out some key points of, of, of common ground. But actually, even if you're looking at the uh, material that they were presenting themselves as parties uh, in 2016 and indeed in the election in 2017, you see a lot of common ground here that's worth mentioning. All of them in favour of specific arrangements for Northern Ireland. <clears throat> um, all of them concerned to avoid a hard Irish border. All of them in favour of ongoing access to the uh, single market um, and all wanting basically frictionless trade that, uh, that includes um, customs arrangements. Plus on top of that, access to EU funding, but of course, um, safeguarding rights of EU citizens, specific protections for agri-food and the like. But I think it's worth reminding ourselves that these areas of convergence between the parties are quite striking. What do they amount to though? Well, essentially, of course, they're amounting to the status quo. Change as little as possible, please, regardless of the vote. Um, 
what has happened within the communities themselves, if this is what the parties have been saying. Um, the report that um, John Gary did, I'm crediting John Gary with a lot, thanks John for the research he did. Uh, so he did a lot on the border and Brexit and ESRC study. Um, and one thing that came out on that is actually very interesting, that amongst the Catholic population, the Catholic respondents, they were, they were more opposed to East-West checks than Protestant respondents were. Um, so essentially the very principle of border controls is something that uh, the Catholic respondents were wary of and wanting to avoid. Um, another dimension comes into this quantitative and qualitative research that they did amongst the Protestant respondents, wary of east-west controls, north-south controls as well, but primarily the question comes down to constitutional and legal frameworks. Um, overall, the results from these surveys were saying the preference of Northern Ireland's population is increasingly for a remain. There's a logic to that, right? For Remain, if they can't get that, then a soft Brexit. So this is where the, the popular position is within Northern Ireland, and increasingly so when you see a lot of um, opinion polls supporting this trend as well. Um, the political views in Northern Ireland, as I say, they're coalescing around status quo up to a certain point. They diverge, of course, when the constitutional question comes to the fore. And ironically, when does the constitutional question come to the fore? When Northern Ireland is seen as a problem. Now, it's not just in relation to the Irish border. Um, it's much more particularly about Northern Ireland being seen to be that, uh, the bridge, if you like, between Britain and the EU. And the question is, how do you view that unique position of Northern Ireland being British and Irish, um, both British and Irish, um, both in, in, not just in terms of identity and culture, but also very much in terms of economic realities. This is why the DUP and other unionist parties are wary. <coughs> so the Lord Ashcroft polls um, earlier this year revealed some interesting findings by looking at uh, um, a survey data from the Republic of Ireland, from Northern Ireland, and from Great Britain. And essentially, uh, Northern, you, it reveals how Northern Ireland's position in public opinion is quite a, a, a tenuous one, particularly amongst Leave voters. So asking GB respondents about whether avoiding a hard border is something that um, should take priority over leaving the EU, um, only 10% of Leave voters were saying, yes, that should be the case. Um, uh, basically, most particularly, uh, whether it's about whether the UK should stay in the customs union and therefore lose its ability or restrain its ability to make trade deals, saying no, avoiding a hard border, these Leave voters are saying, is not uh, something that should um, come, uh, should, that, that is not the price they should pay. They should leave the customs union even if that means a hard border. And this is striking not just because it includes Conservative and Unionist Party as well. Um, so basically, if it wasn't possible to avoid a hard border and for uh, the UK to leave the EU customs union single market, um, uh, uh, Basically, uh, what's, what's your priority? Is it to keep the union together, keep Northern Ireland as a core part of the United Kingdom, England, Scotland and Wales in this UK, or is it to leave the EU? Um, we see that essentially 73% of Tory um, um, <coughs> Leave voters are saying they want, to, they want to leave the EU. That's their priority. So it's worth bearing this in mind when we have the question of the Northern Ireland Ireland Protocol right on the table, uh, because actually behind it all is this deep uncertainty about how much uh, of a, a priority and a preference would be given to the United Kingdom itself um, uh, if it comes to a tension between that and the process of Brexit. So the challenge, of course, the root challenge um, comes down to the key point. Kevin's already mentioned it. How can you keep the status quo, particularly how can you keep the status quo for Northern Ireland and yet have the UK as a whole uh, be outside of the EU. <coughs> and the way this has been dealt with in, in many circles is simply to avoid that question, uh, to avoid the realities of what it means to be outside the EU. Um, the question of the status quo is, has become a priority for most of the, the parties in Northern Ireland, building on what I mentioned earlier, that keeping the status quo, changing as little as possible, that's a priority. And we see that in the UK government's position too, that it emphasises in the preamble to the protocol, actually, they don't want people in Northern Ireland or in the Republic of Ireland, actually, to notice much change um, in, as a result of Brexit. For unionists' interpretation, 
it's about the UK as a whole. That's what they would emphasise in that kind of in this particular decision. Um, is it the case that the UK as a whole, Northern Ireland within that, is experiencing this in exactly the same way? And this is why you have the tension within parties in, in Northern Ireland. The backstop attempts to resolve all of this, albeit one that's put on the um, uh, put on the longer long finger for a while to become only at the end of transition period. Um, the UK government itself, in its explanatory slides, describes it as an uncomfortable arrangement, which says a lot. So essentially, it's trying to do several things, and there's core paradoxes and tensions within the backstop. So it's saying, the UK government is saying, this is necessary, it's absolutely essential, and yet at the same time, none of us want it. Um, they're saying it's temporary, and at the same time, it's indefinite, we don't know when it's going to end. It's all UK. There's an all UK dimension that's absolutely fundamentally important because the Constitution of the UK, or, but it's also Northern Ireland specific. Um, and those tensions and those paradoxes are very difficult to explain, particularly when uh, one dimension or another is emphasised depending on which audience um, Theresa May is speaking to. So I'm going to predict, no, I'm not, I'm going to say um, where we might land. And actually, I'm not going to reveal anything very um, uh, dynamic here, but essentially there's three scenarios. The first is that there may be no Brexit at all, and that's possibly, I think that's more likely uh, uh, than maybe it looked to be a month ago. What that would mean, being no doubt, would be flux in the short term, because that no Brexit would only come about with serious flux, particularly um, in Westminster, it may involve a general election. Longer term, however, it will bring stability and, and more security. Um, uh, not necessarily within the EU. <coughs> the alternative then is the withdrawal agreement. We could end up with a withdrawal agreement. We will have a backstop in that, a protocol <coughs> deal with Ireland, Northern Ireland, that will look exactly the same uh, or very similar to the way it looks now, possibly with a modification of the all UK dimension. Maybe you'll talk about that. That means stability now. And this is why businesses in Northern Ireland and many, most of the parties are wanting this, because it brings stability and certainty and security for a short period of time, including the transition period. Longer term, however, be in no doubt, there will be flux and significant change, and particularly when it comes to managing uh, the question of Northern Ireland's specific arrangements um, and the Irish border, there's, there's, there's risks entailed in that. Or we can have no deal which is flux now and flux later. <laughs> so essentially all that we can be sure about at this particular time, regardless of the reasons why people voted for Brexit or what they thought they were voting for, what we only know now is that there's going to be continued flux and uncertainty, either in the short term or in the longer term. Thank you.